I mean, there are different ways to think about this, this death that ends the poem. I, I, you know, I would say one of the things that I find compelling uh, in these lines, and this is a, a kind of image that recurs in, in Wordsworth's poetry, is the image, you know, of the boy being kind of taken into the world, right, being taken into to earth, uh, into, into nature. Uh, and so this kind of sense in which the, the sort of, you know, communion with nature that, you know, uh, uh, becomes possible in the first part of the poem uh, is sort of continued, right, or sort of uh, uh, sort of pursued in a different form, right, by his uh, death and, and kind of burial and sort of reception into the, the, the ground, right? If you only had, you know, a short period of time, if you, if you only made it to childhood, you know, like, 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 what's the, um, is, is that, is that a full, is that a full life, you know, um, and, and this image of like, of the boy who just, who, who's, whose whole, you know, the, the, the apex or the, the maturity of his experience is this, you know, mm -hmm. communing with nature, yeah. um, and, 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 and feeling that penetrating silence of the natural world and, you know, being stirred by that. Uh, and, you know, I would just say that in general, right, the encounter with a work of art, uh, is sort of a reminder, uh, uh, again, if we think about it in these particular terms, uh, it's a reminder that there are different ways to kind of think about or to sort of be in the world. There are other forms of, uh, you know, feeling essentially um, that really can't be reduced uh, or sort of like made harmonious with the sort of demands uh, of, of capitalist modernity. All right. I'm talking to Dr. Ellerman. Dr. Ellerman is a lecturer at Yale University of English Literature. He is an expert in the romantics. He wrote a book uh, on the romantics called Thoughts Wilderness. Uh, Thoughts Wilderness. Dr. Ellerman, uh, thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, uh, just to start off, you know, can you can you tell us a little bit about who the romantics are and, and why sure. they matter? Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me uh, uh, here today, Amakai. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's fun to to talk about this stuff. So it's a nice, nice, nice opportunity. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, my uh, you know recent book is focused on on romanticism, and uh, you know when we talk about romanticism, we mean a variety of things. But you know, in general, the way I like to to explain it is that you know romanticism is a kind of aesthetic movement, a kind of philosophical movement um, centered around the year eighteen hundred. Uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, to be to be precise, um, and, and really in some ways here we're dealing with. Uh, the kind of first uh, poetic and, and sort of philosophical movement that in many ways kind of uh, uh, responds to uh, the French Revolution on the one hand, the kind of massive political upheavals associated with this uh, political revolution, um, uh, at the same time responding to what, you know, is often thought of as the kind of Kantian revolution in philosophy. And here we have a kind of development of a modern notion of, of the self for the subject, basically. Um, that I think really does inform a lot of the poetic and philosophical writing from this period. And so, yeah, to understand the work that's being done in, in uh, poetry and in philosophical writing around uh, the year 1800 is to think about these two uh, sort of revolutionary uh, events, right, as kind of conditioning uh, a lot of what's taking place. Yeah, I think I think there's a stereotype of um, romantic poetry as being very uh, focused on nature. Is that is that fair? Um, yeah. How else would you describe kind of the, the the literature and the work of the time? Yeah, I mean, I think the the kind of association with nature is interesting. On on one hand, it, it's uh, true, uh, and this is basically the topic of my book to kind of go back to uh, the romantic concept of nature and think about this in a, a kind of fresh way. Um, I think the stereotype often, uh, you know, sort of identifies the romantics as escaping from politics to the natural world, sort of fleeing uh, from uh, the demands of social life, from uh, ordinary reality, and sort of looking for something uh, kind of imaginative or, or sort of uh, transcendent, right, in the, the natural world. And so I guess part of what I'm trying to do is to sort of... Uh, yeah, kind of rethink this opposition a little bit and, and look at the ways that, you know, nature for the romantics uh, really is a kind of political category and really does respond again to these two uh, revolutions, right? The political and the philosophical revolution uh, that I was just speaking about before. Yeah, and I'd love to sort of just make it a little more concrete and sort of maybe one of two possible ways. One is if you right. can just specifically name some of those, the famous romantics that we should be thinking about when we think about uh, this time period. And then maybe two, if you're willing to talk about um, concretely, specifically, what drew you, you know, to this era and to this time period of study? 
Yeah, those are uh, yeah important questions. Uh, I mean, in terms of poetry, right? Uh, William Wordsworth is probably the best known of the British Romantic poets. Um, I think he is the uh, uh, you know poet who really does sort of uh, you know set the terms for uh, critical debate for our kind of broad preconceptions about what Romantic poetry is and does. Um, when we think about romanticism, when we think about nature, imagination, right, the kind of uh, whole sort of situation, uh, we're often thinking about Wordsworth. So I think he's really, uh, you know, someone who we who we should keep, uh, you know, kind of at the, the, the forefront here. Um, you know, philosophically speaking, you know, Kant and his followers, uh, I think about Schelling, I think about Hegel, um, even to a certain extent later in the 19th century, I think Marx kind of fits into this long romantic line. Um, so these are some of the figures that that I have in mind when I'm, you know, talking about romanticism in general here. Uh, in terms of my own, you know, attraction to the field, I mean, I've been interested in, in uh, the poetry and philosophy of nature for a long time. Uh, I think, uh, you know, nature writing is something that's kind of appealed to me for 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 many years. It's something I've thought about a lot. Uh, you know, I, I grew up uh, uh, in the in the country, right? I, I uh, uh, have definitely, uh, you know, kind of a personal uh, connection to some of these ideas about nature that I think, uh, you know, I see the romantics articulating. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is part of it. I mean, I've been a, a kind of reader and a student really my whole life. And so, you know, just as a kind of, uh, you know, field of academic study too, I mean, there was just something that seemed uh, kind of right, I, I suppose, about this this sort of area. And that's, uh, yeah, I think part of what, what led me to it. You mentioned um, some poets and some philosophers there, uh, Kant and Hegel being the philosophical side. Is there a tension mm -hmm between maybe those two lines of uh, of writing in this period? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say no, actually. And this is another one of the things that really, you know, kind of drew me uh, to, to romanticism. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find so compelling about the romantics as a sort of... Uh, you know, group, let's say, uh, is the ways in which both, you know, in England and in Germany, which are the two uh, sort of countries whose whose writers I, I kind of focus on, um, in both places, I would say, in their different kinds of ways, uh, there's a kind of strong sense, right, that poetry is a kind of thought, right, is a kind of thinking, right, and so that there is a kind of philosophical work that's done in poetry and in writing poetry, uh, and, you know, in the same way, uh, I do think romantic philosophy tries to kind of think of itself in aesthetic terms, right, both as a sort of style of writing and thinking, but also in terms of uh, really the kind of pride of place that art or the sort of work of art, we might say, uh, is often given in the various kind of philosophical systems of the period. Um, so in some sense, right, these kinds of divisions, these sort of disciplinary divisions, uh, they don't really stand up, uh, 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 you know, when we're talking about the Romantic period. Uh, in part, right, they haven't completely separated out from one another, historically speaking, and the sort of university is really just kind of uh, you know, coming into being in the sort of modern sense at this period. But I think, you know, in the thought of the romantics themselves, right, there's this sort of effort to bring poetry and philosophy together. And that's one of the things I really like about the work. Wow. So I want to maybe just sort of echo back what I what I heard, because it feels like a very strong and surprising uh, statement. I think I think for most people on the outside, there's there there does seem to be um, a deep separation between these two these two mm -hmm. strands of writing between poetry yeah. on the one hand and philosophy and specifically in, in college i took a course where you know we did some kant and hegel you know it was sure. you know as some I, I don't remember which which intellectual history course it was but um my point being i don't have any any real grounding in in those writings but there's this mm -hmm. sort of, again a, a, a stereotypical understanding of these being you know impenetrable uh texts by you know very very difficult um you know german yeah. Uh, German writers, <laughs> um, and so and so, the 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 project and, and the understanding to draw a line of connection between that and uh, the the aesthetic uh, world of poetry is is a very mm -hmm. I think a strong uh, statement um, that probably requires some very you know clear seeing into into both of those uh, texts. Yeah, I mean, just to give a few examples, 
you know, in Kant's critical philosophy, which is the the sort of uh, philosophical system uh, that he elaborated towards the end of his life from, you know, the 1780s onward, you know, he didn't set out to do this, but ultimately by the time he had kind of put all the pieces in, in place, right, and written his three critiques, uh, by the end in the critique of judgment, he, he realized that he ultimately needed a kind of theory of beauty, a, a sort of philosophy of beauty, uh, in order to sort of tie the whole system together. Um, and this is a kind of pattern that I think really does uh, recur throughout a lot of the uh, uh, romantic philosophy, uh, uh, really around, again, the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. This, this idea that it's, you know, the work of art or the concept of beauty uh, uh, that kind of brings the whole sort of like philosophical apparatus together. Um, you know, we see it in Schelling and the system of transcendental idealism, right? The work of art is the thing that unifies uh, the realm of nature and the realm of freedom. Uh, we see it in Hegel even to a certain extent, right? Where art becomes one of the ways of uh, expressing the, the absolute. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, this kind of appeal, right, to artworks, uh, again, is the thing that really does uh, kind of make it all hang together. Um, on the philosophical side, right, this is a really, really prevalent kind of pattern. Um, on the other side, too, in, in poetry, right, for a thinker, uh, a poet, you know, like Wordsworth, um, you know, there's this kind of claim, and he makes this pretty explicitly throughout his kind of career, uh, that he uh, is at work uh, on a great philosophic song, uh, as he calls it, right? A, a kind of song, a great work, a great poem, right? That will express all the kind of philosophic truths of his era, of his age, um, but we'll do it in a, a kind of poetic form, right? And we'll make it, um, you know, uh, feelable, right? We'll make it kind of accessible uh, in a way that systematic philosophy alone could never really do. Uh, and so again, for poets and philosophers, right? We see this sort of effort to kind of transcend that division. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of myself as sometimes pretending at least, I, I pretend to be somewhat well-read, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I can, in, in moments of weakness, you know, I can like maybe take pride or something in the fact that I've read a lot of books or whatever, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not uh, drawn or I don't have experience with, with the, the writing of, of Kant and, and Hegel, mm -hmm. you know, my experiences with them have been fairly uh, challenging and, and haven't like drawn me in, you know, do, do you yeah, feel like, sure. um, was there a language barrier there? Is there, is there just something lost in our society? Is it, how, how do you look at that? Um, is, is that a shame? Do you feel like people are missing out when they don't have access to those ideas um, the way the way you do? How, how do you think about that? Uh, well, a few things. I mean, I, you know, the the philosophy of German idealism is highly technical, right? And it, it's kind of shaped by a certain sort of technical vocabulary. It's a specialized vocabulary. Um, but it's a vocabulary that really does kind of condition a lot of the philosophical work done from, you know, let's say 1780 up until the middle of the 19th century at the least. And I think once you are in that kind of frame of mind, it's sort of easier to, to get your bearings and to kind of figure out where you are. And so there is a, a sort of a threshold to, to cross and then you're sort of you're sort of in it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think in some ways, right, the language barrier is very real. Uh, you know, special training, right, is is kind of the way to, to get into that. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I do think a lot of these ideas are ideas that we all sort of carry with us, you know, regardless of whether or not we've had this kind of special background or this specialized training. You know, I think I started off by saying something about, you know, the Kantian revolution in, in philosophy, right, is the sort of inauguration of a modern idea of the self, right? And this is one of the things that, again, I think the romantics really uh, pick up from. Um, this sort of idea of, of selfhood, right, of, of subjectivity, as it's called in the sort of technical language of the period, you know, this is an idea that I think most people sort of abide by, whether or not they know it comes from Kant. Uh, the, the idea, right, that we're sort of self-reflective beings, right, that we're kind of self-conscious, that we have this capacity, you know, to think about ourselves thinking, basically. Um the kind of connection between this and our sort of capacity to act freely, to be free agents. Um, these are ideas that, you know, a, a thinker like Kant really does sort of spell out for the first time, historically speaking. Uh, and I think, you know, this really does kind of shape the way most people uh, think about who they are. Uh, and so, 
you know, they might not have the sort of vocabulary, right, that Kant uses to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, but I do think it's there for a lot of us. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I'm not sure how much is like lost per se, but uh, yeah, uh, some of these ideas I think circulate much more widely than we might expect. Yeah. I'll give you a thought. You could tell me if this resonates or this is totally different and and not related at all. But um, I love uh, one of my favorite writers and thinkers is Michel Foucault. And I've read uh, extensively in Michel Foucault and I carry what he was. He's written extensively. You know, I I think about it a lot. Um, But, but I, I also believe that he's a bad writer. Like, I believe that he was a, a terrible messenger of his ideas. Okay. No way. Now, obviously, I'm sure other, like, real experts would might disagree with me or whatever. Mm-hmm. They might say he was, wrote, you know, in a great way. I don't know. But um, I, I wonder, I wonder if, if you or your students ever, ever wrestle with that kind of attention, where mm-hmm. the tension being, um, there's wonderful content, but this, this packaging um, is tough. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, that's where the poetry comes in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, someone like Wordsworth, I would, you know, cite Percy Shelley in this context as well. Um, these are writers who, you know, have varying degrees of knowledge about the sort of philosophical currents uh, that are kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, present in their in their period, right, in their sort of general milieu. Um, but they're not philosophers, right? These, these are poets. Um, and so, I do see them as thinking through a lot of the same issues, these questions, again, of subjectivity or selfhood, questions about, you know, human freedom, the kind of capacities or sort of limits of human action, our relationship to the natural world, I think most kind of pressingly, Uh, you know, these ideas kind of come back uh, or sort of are present also in the poetry of the Romantic period uh, and expressed in a really, really different form, right? So from a different direction, I think these poets are sort of trying to get at a lot of the big questions that I see the philosophers of the period asking as well. So, you know, on the question of style or sort of philosophical form, uh, you know, the, these are, uh, you know, important and kind of different approaches to a lot of the same issues that I think we we see here. In terms of like, you know, Kant as a writer, uh, you know, he's not what we would traditionally call a good writer, like a good prose stylist. Um, at the same time, you know, I think there's something tricky about this question. His earlier writings, right, kind of from earlier in the 18th century are much more sort of uh, rhetorically polished, right? They're much more sort of accessible, approachable, kind of pleasurable to read. But the thought is much less sophisticated. Uh, And so I do think like by the end of the 18th century, he's trying to be precise, right, in a way that I think is really, really important. And he's clearly trying to kind of uh, capture something or accomplish something on the level of style that for us does really read as just a kind of incredible difficulty. I think at times it's really uh, uh, inaccessible. Uh, and yet, you know, there's uh, a purpose to it, right? A kind of precision that I think he's after um, that, you know, can, yeah, can be quite off putting. Yeah, I think it's important for someone in this kind of a role, like my own, who's sort of a layman trying to sort of, uh, you know, learn from from other mm-hmm. people. It's very important to recognize and, and respect the fact that a lot of subjects there's like a barrier to entry in a sense you know so for example yeah. physics i've spoken to physicists sure. on my youtube channel you know and there's an expectation there that me as a layperson or a viewer is not necessarily going to open up a graduate level physics textbook yeah, and just absolutely. be like oh this is this makes great sense you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. um and so i think it's important yeah to sort of just just be aware and and like i said mindful um the fact that when you're when you're doing work in, within a certain uh, intellectual milieu, or, or we mm-hmm. might call some might say on the cutting edge or whatever, there is of course going to be a, a kind of yeah. a, a language barrier, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the nature of doing serious work, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that's right. Uh, you know, at the same time, I don't, I don't think philosophy is, you know, physics, right? And so, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what the uh, distinction is in terms of like uh, uh, the kind of training required to sort of uh, enter into these debates or conversations. Uh, but my sense is that, uh, you know, uh, there's something alienating, obviously, about reading Kant or Hegel at first. But I think, uh, you know, I think many people and probably many more people than, than would give themselves, uh, you know, credit for, for being able to do this uh, can, can, you know, get there, I think, in a way that you know, really, really uh, advanced theoretical physics. Um, that seems to me like a pretty different, uh, pretty different world. Interesting. Yeah. 
Okay. On my notes, I had here at this point to start, you know, jumping into your book, um, which we are definitely going to do. Um, but I thought maybe just the nature of the conversation, we could start with um, maybe a reading from Wordsworth, if you're okay with sure. that. Yeah, great. Um, just Absolutely. Sort of piggybacking on our on our conversation here about the relation between poetry and philosophy. Right. Um, yeah. So, so you you have suggested a reading. Um, if so, if you're willing to share that with us, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, I thought I would read uh, most of uh, a lyric poem which circulates under the name "There Was a Boy." Uh, this is a poem that takes a number of different forms over uh, the course of Wordsworth's life. Uh, it's eventually incorporated into his long poem, "The Prelude," uh, which is his great sort of autobiographical epic poem. Um, he writes it well before he begins uh, uh, the the prelude in its kind of fullest form, uh, and he you know publishes it in a variety of forms throughout his life. Um, but it's a really uh, sort of wonderful uh, kind of lyric poem, uh, ultimately a kind of lyric poem about an encounter with the natural world. Uh, and it does, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to see, uh, you know, I think kind of raise these questions of the relationship between consciousness and the natural world uh, in ways that, you know, again, I think are really profoundly philosophical. Uh, but yeah, it sort of uh, uh, clearly comes across quite differently here in, in the form of a, of a lyric. So uh, that's why I thought this would be a good, uh, yeah, a good reading. So awesome. I'll read it now. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Right. And this is coming from the, uh, the Oxford uh, Wordsworth, for those who, who care. <laughs> there was a boy, you knew him well, ye cliffs and islands of Winander. Many a time at evening when the stars had just begun to move along the edges of the hills, rising or setting, would he stand alone beneath the trees or by the glimmering lake, and there with fingers interwoven, both hands pressed closely palm to palm, and to his mouth uplifted, he, as through an instrument, blew mimic hootings to the silent owls that they might answer him. And they would shout across the watery vale and shout again, responsive to his call with quivering peals and long halloos and screams and echoes loud redoubled and redoubled, concourse wild of mirth and jocund din. And when it chanced that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill, then sometimes in that silence, while he hung listening, a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents or the visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery, its rocks, its woods, and that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. I'll pause there. Yeah, what, what can you tell? I mean, it's a beautiful poem. And I think, yeah. honestly, I think if we wanted to, I, I think we could discuss it for an hour. But uh, <laughs> I don't have time. For, yeah. Um, what, can you, what, what can you just explain about those last lines that you read about... There's there's a silence. Sometimes in that silence, mm -hmm. while he hung listening, a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain tor torrents mm -hmm. or the visible scene. So so what's what, what what is happening in that last in that last piece there? There's silence and it enters into his heart. How, how do you understand that? What do, what do you think of that? Well, I mean. It's a, a poem that, you know, I'm just profoundly moved by on one level. I think the language is absolutely beautiful. As I said, philosophically speaking, I think there's something really interesting happening here. And I do write, you know, pretty extensively about this poem in, in, in my book. I guess one of the things I'm interested in here uh, is the way in which, you know, over the course of this experience, right, we see this young boy uh, who's learned how to kind of mimic the sound uh, of owls, right? He, he's learned these bird calls effectively. Uh, and he, you know, goes out into the the, the forest right at night uh, to 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 you know kind of interact with the owls to sort of uh, encourage them to respond to his calls um, to to kind of uh, in some ways take control of the natural uh, uh, scene right he's he's sort of intervening in it and he's provoking a kind of response he's demanding a response from the natural world and one of the things that happens over the course of the the poem right or at least this portion of it is that uh, intermittently, right, the world fails to respond in the way that he uh, expects it to. Uh, the owls don't respond, something goes wrong effectively. Uh, and instead of being met by uh, the birds, right, answering to his bird call, uh, he, he's met with silence, right? He hears uh, a kind of silence. Um, and in that silence, right, all sorts of other things start to emerge for him, right? Other kinds of uh, sensory experiences, 
uh, and ultimately a, a different kind of quality of experience, uh, something inside himself, I would say, starts to kind of emerge. Uh, and uh, yeah, it all takes a slightly different shape than, than he expected. There's a kind of surprise uh, that, that, that sort of uh, uh, meets him here. Mm-hmm. And so I guess one of the things I'm interested in is that sort of contrast, right, that Wordsworth is establishing between, uh, uh, you know, the call and response, right, the kind of uh, effective sort of mastery of the scene that the boy uh, uh, tries to kind of put into motion, uh, and this kind of failure, right, this moment where nature uh, does not respond in the way that he expects, uh, but in fact, uh, tells him something different, right, something kind of unanticipated. And that difference to me seems really, really quite uh, significant. Mm-hmm. I Yeah, when I, when I think about nature, when I think about communing with nature, which I think is mm-hmm. something that certainly personally, uh, I feel very alienated from most of the time in the modern sure. world. Yeah. But uh, in, in, in moments where, where I feel less alienated, mm-hmm. um, I think the word silence is a, is a crucial word. You know, mm-hmm. I think when, when you're going into nature um, and you're able to uh, be benefit, nurtured, nurtured from that experience, um, you're, I think there's, there's a tapping into a kind of a silence um, that is, you know, an echo of the, uh, the natural sounds and, and an internal kind of uh, mm-hmm. restfulness or peace or something. And so that, that to me, I think it could be, I could have been primed from the readings of your book that I did. Um, but, but perhaps, you know, in my own reading of the poem, there's this, this sort this interplay of the, the external quiet and the internal quiet. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I would even go a little bit further, right? Um, there's a sort of benefit, right, that the poem's uh, uh, sort of central figure derives from this, but there's also something, uh, you know, kind of mutually beneficial here, right? Like the world is not forced to kind of respond in the way that the boy uh, uh, expects it to, right? And there's a kind of uh, ethical relation that starts to emerge here in this sort of mutual silence, right? The, the the boy learns to kind of interact with the world differently, right? Or sort of suggests that it might be possible to do such a thing. Uh, and the world itself, right, is sort of uh, uh, given a kind of uh, sort of respect, right? A sort of uh, uh, kind of ethical uh, sort of recognition almost takes place here in a way that I think is really important. And so, yeah, to think about the way that this, uh, you know, again, call and response situation breaks down but actually in turn poses new kinds of ethical possibilities or raises new ethical possibilities. I think that's part of what Wordsworth is trying to kind of think through here. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned over the, you know, I would say relatively recently in my life, um, because it was not obvious to me growing up, but mm-hmm. is that nature is, is very important. And that spending, spending those, those times in nature to be able to, to listen to nature and listen to your, to yourself or something, mm-hmm. you know, uh, is actually extremely uh, healthful and 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 nurturing yeah, uh, psychologically sure. speaking, and so you know certainly in this poem, but maybe as part of the the project, the romantics more generally, there's there's that awareness of uh, our our interdependence uh, mm-hmm. with the natural world in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, a kind of complicated interdependence, right? Because, you know, even in the most sort of exploitative uh, uh, relationship with the natural world, there's a kind of interdependence, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I would say here what Wordsworth is trying to to kind of uh, describe or to sort of think his way toward is a sort of, uh, you know, relationship that, again, lets the natural world sort of exist on its own terms. And I think that's part of what's important about this this passage that I just read. Uh, you know, nature actually sounds and looks really different, right, from what the boy expects in the course of this poem. Uh, and so that that difference, right, and that kind of surprise, again, um, I think that's really the kind of key moment here. Yeah. Now, as as you well know, and, and maybe some of the most astute uh, listeners will know, there's another paragraph after what you read. Yeah. Um, does it make sense to read that also now? I'd be happy to. I mean, the reason I stopped where I did actually is that in the earliest versions of this poem, there's no more. The poem stops where I left off, basically. Uh, later, as Wordsworth continues to work on the poem, he adds uh, a final verse paragraph, as you as you said, uh, and it's a, a paragraph that kind of takes us into some pretty different territory. So I'd, I'd be happy to read it, but uh, yeah, it's I, I I see it as a sort of departure from the main lines of the text. I respect but. I respect that decision, and I understand <laughs> I understand the motivation behind that decision. Yeah, personally, as a reader it's of the poem, of course. But. Yeah, reading it reading it with the that yeah. final paragraph, mm-hmm. 
I, 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 my mind sort of made meaning in the context of that final paragraph. Great. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's not the only way to, to read the poem. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Would you like to hear it? Should I read sure, it? Sure, please do. Yeah, please. Okay, Go ahead. great. Yeah. So there's just a few more lines. Mm -hmm. This boy, the Winander boy, was taken from his mates and died in childhood ere he was full 10 years old. Fair are the woods and beauteous is the spot, the vale where he was born. The churchyard hangs upon a slope above the village door, above the village school, excuse me. And there along that bank, when I have passed at evening, I believe that oftentimes a full half hour together, I have stood mute looking at the grave in which he lies. Yeah. It's so quite different. It is different. Um, but thinking personally, the way, the way I read it, you know, with that, with that final paragraph, um, mm -hmm. You know, like I, I know people, I'm sure if, you know, people viewing this know people or have experience of loss of, of children, you know, seeing a, a child die, you know, mm -hmm. at a young age. And I think yeah. in the version you read, it was 10. Um, and and a, a question that comes up, you know, philosophically speaking, psychologically speaking is, you know, if you only had, you know, a short period of time, if you, if you only made it to childhood, you know, like, like, like what's the... um. Is, is that is that a full is that a full life you know um and, and this image of like of the boy who just who who's whose whole you know the the, the apex or the the maturity of his experience is this you know mm -hmm. communing with nature yeah um and 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 feeling that penetrating silence of the natural world and you know being stirred by that and then and then the silence of the boy uh or the silence you know that or i guess the, the lack of the response of nature mm -hmm. in that moment maybe paralleling the mute standing by the grave you yeah, know absolutely and the end of the poem yeah the parallels between these two sections are really notable and you know there's a lot of important critics uh you know jeffrey hartman paul demon uh, who've sort of pointed out the the ways in which these two sections of the poem which seem so unrelated uh really do actually kind of speak to to one another quite quite interestingly I mean, there are different ways to think about this this death that ends the poem. I, I you know, I would say one of the things that I find compelling uh, in these lines, and this is a, a kind of image that recurs in in Wordsworth's poetry, is the image, you know, of the boy being kind of taken into the world, right? Being taken into to earth, uh, into into nature, uh, and so this kind of sense in which the the sort of you know communion with nature that you know uh, uh becomes possible in the first part of the poem uh is sort of continued right or sort of uh, uh sort of pursued in a different form right by his uh death and, and kind of burial and sort of reception into the 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 ground right um you know there, there's a way in which uh these things are not so different right by a certain line of thinking you know uh there's a few other words worth poems that Kind of play on this idea uh, uh, as well. Uh, you know, you could think about uh, some of the Lucy poems, for example, right? These kind of famous uh, elegies that Wordsworth was writing at about the same time. Poems that, you know, again, envision, right, the kind of condition of, uh, uh, you know, dying, right, as in fact, really just kind of becoming uh, closer to uh, nature, right, being sort of taken into, uh, again, the ground or the earth, uh, in ways that, um, yeah, are, are not quite so, uh, you know, not quite so mournful, maybe as we might uh, expect. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the deep insights that are available when 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 a human mind sort of spends that time in nature is is an understanding of the circle of life and the cycles of life and death that sure. uh, animate the natural world. Um, and again, I think uh, the the price we pay in being so alienated from nature. Mm -hmm. um, is being is being alienated from that wisdom of um you know just just the the tides and the ebb and flow of of mm -hmm. of of life on this planet yeah absolutely and i do think this is something that wordsworth is really quite attuned to i mean there are moments of just incredible sort of specificity of of description uh that really do kind of run throughout his his poetry and you know he's a poet who of course thinks about these big philosophical questions that i was talking about you know in the first half of our our conversation but he's also a poet who's really sort of rooted in a particular place right and his uh uh you know kind of relationship to the, the lake district in the north of england uh, it's a sort of famous relationship right he's you know associated with this uh, place to the extent that it, you know, becomes a kind of tourist attraction at this point. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's something about the kind of, uh, again, concreteness of that relationship that really is important as well.
And would you say man's relationship to the natural world was in, was in flux around this time period? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the romantics didn't have a full sense, uh, of course, of the uh, sort of changes in, in uh, you know, the relationship between uh, humanity and, and nature, uh, the kinds of uh, ultimately sort of catastrophic uh, consequences of this this relationship. Uh, they didn't know what we know now, obviously, they couldn't have because, you know, uh, things were not uh, then as they are now, obviously. Uh, at the same time, uh, they are, you know, much more sort of attuned uh, to the kind of problematic dimensions of this relationship, to the kind of exploitation and violence, I would say, that sort of undergirds it. You know, uh, they think a lot about climate change, even to a certain extent, uh, not quite in the form that we understand it today, obviously, but even by the 1830s, right, there's a kind of sense that there's a close relationship, right, uh, between industrialization, uh, the exploitation of the natural world, the kind of mastery of the natural world, uh, and atmospheric changes. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, something that the romantics are, are completely, uh, you know, blind to. Uh, and so a lot of the things that, uh, you know, I think uh, we uh, people are, are talking about recently, right? Um, these are, are, are issues that, uh, yeah, have been debated for quite a long time. Yeah, maybe maybe now's a good time to start talking about Thoughts Wilderness. Sure. Um, so we'll just start with the title. Uh, where, where does the title come from and why is it uh, a meaningful title for your book? The title comes from Percy Shelley, uh, and it's a sort of uh, a modified citation, let's say, from uh, his poem Prometheus Unbound. You know, I, I use the title uh, in a variety of ways, but ultimately what I'm trying to describe with this notion of thought's wilderness um, is really a, a kind of uh, a state of consciousness, uh, a sort of state of consciousness that tries to, uh, you know, do justice to the natural world in its kind of uh, specificity and its particularity. Uh, but even more than that, tries to uh, kind of imagine or sort of uh, uh, make possible, right, a sort of relationship between humanity or human consciousness in particular in the natural world, uh, a relationship that would not be, uh, uh, you know, one of mastery or domination, uh, a kind of relationship that would, uh, in some ways, right, sort of let the natural world be on its own terms. And, you know, you can think again, back to the lines from There Was a Boy that I read a few minutes ago, um, this moment, right, this kind of emergence of silence, right? Um, this is just one example of that kind of state of mind that I'm sort of tracking throughout, uh, again, a series of romantic poems in the period. Yeah. Um, I have I have specific questions, but yeah. maybe maybe it would make sense to start with uh, with a reading uh, from sure. the book to give, give the people a taste. Great. Yeah. And I think this, uh, you know, might fill out uh, the sort of idea uh, of Thoughts Wilderness a little bit further. I just thought I would read a bit from the introduction, uh, and so I'll just start at the beginning, and uh, I'll jump around a little bit, but uh, basically this is just from the first few pages. Perfect. Like many romantics, Percy Shelley was drawn to wilderness. The language of wild nature recurs in his poetry in often surprising ways. For Shelley, wilderness is not a tangled wood or a craggy mountain face. It is nature in flight from consciousness a manifold of evanescent forms. In Prometheus Unbound, he writes of a swift cloud that wings the wide air's wildernesses. Meanwhile, in the famous Ode to the West Wind, he hails the wild west wind, breath of autumn's being. Such images of unseen presence are not only images of the natural world, they also evoke a state of consciousness, a poetic or aesthetic state in which wilderness might be perceived. In a phrase borrowed from Shelley, I call this thought's wilderness, a relation of mind to nature, yet a relation without mastery or control. Titled after Shelley's words, this book shows how romantic writing sought to circumvent the domination of nature essential to modern capitalism. Moving between the poetry and philosophy of the period, I find an attunement to nature's ephemeral, ungraspable forms, clouds of vapor, a trace of ruin, deep silence, and the world surrounding ether. For the writers featured here, including Kant, Hegel, Wollstonecraft, Wordsworth, and Shelley, nature is fleetingly sensed but never finally grasped. The book describes how nature's vanishing, its vulnerability, and its flight from apprehension becomes a philosophical and political problem. 
Of course, the Romantics still try to present nature aesthetically. They do so by developing what I term a poetics of wilderness, a poetics that is attentive to fleeting presence and that seeks to let things be. Trying to imagine what ultimately eludes capture, the Romantics recognize the complicity between conceptual and economic domination. They see how thought itself becomes a technology for control. This insight, I argue, motivates romantic efforts to think past capitalist instrumentality and its devastation of the world. While recent ecological thinking rejects distinctions between social and natural processes, human and non-human things, I maintain that a concept of nature is analytically and politically indispensable. The concept of nature, I argue throughout the book, allows thinking to begin with difference or non-identity. And only thus can thinking juxtapose relations and laws of motion internal to capitalist society with relations and laws of motion internal to nature. Without a concept of nature, in other words, thought's limits are the limits of the world that capitalism has made. To think nature's non-identity means developing new forms of thought, forms that might suspend or interrupt the pursuit of mastery. In the philosophy of romantic idealism, the notion of apprehension presents just such a possibility. On one hand, apprehensive consciousness grasps or appropriates nature. It seems to bear out the philosopher Theodore Adorno's claim that our knowledge of nature is preformed by the demand that we dominate nature. On the other hand, as the Romantics suggest, apprehension may be reformed in the name of a less demanding relation to the world. This ambivalence persists, I argue, in the Romantics' frequent recourse to the term. There's no returning to simple unity with nature. History's path cannot be traveled in reverse. But in the thought of nature's non-identity, Romanticism holds out a hope of something else, a poetic form of apprehension. While never entirely separable from appropriative consciousness or from the laws of commerce that condition it, poetic apprehension suggests, if only in fleeting moments, that the mastery of nature need not run its course. The romantic poetics of wilderness, developed in various ways from this thought, reminds us that another relation to the world is possible. And I'll stop there. Beautiful. So I think, uh, I, I assume that... Um the the listener will will have uh understood well you know the what what you've read but in, in my own uh echoing just uh, there's no my point is there's no need for me to echo back anything you just read because it was perfectly clear but um for the purpose of this conversation uh if i can echo back maybe a piece of, of, of you know of what right. uh what's standing out to me now um this this duality between uh mastery on the one hand and domination on the one hand versus mm -hmm. apprehension. And so there's this, uh, an understanding a thinking about different um, modes of, of interfacing of relating to the natural world. Yeah. And, absolutely. and, and that's, and that's the exploration. And then um, in the book, you know, some of the themes that, that come up um, are, you know, questions of imagination and, and consciousness um, and thought and, um, and so maybe maybe you can speak to just in what what exactly yeah how do we how do we think about apprehension you you spoke about apprehension just now you read about apprehension this poetic apprehension can you can you elaborate on that uh, a little more and help us understand that a little better yeah I mean apprehension is the central philosophical concept of the book basically and I think it's a, a kind of a two sided notion you know, on one hand, there's a kind of uh, form of apprehension that I think the romantics, both the poets and the philosophers are are, are isolating and trying to think through. Uh, and this would be a kind of apprehension of the natural world uh, that is uh, inherently um, controlling, right? Um, and so this is a form of thought, right, that in some ways lends itself to the purposes uh, of the kind of emergent sort of industrial capitalist order, uh, and so uh, to understand apprehension in this way, right, the romantics are, are basically kind of critical about this version of apprehension, right? They, they see uh, uh, this kind of desire uh, to uh, master, to take control of the natural world. Uh, and this is a kind of desire that, you know, they argue uh, plays itself out on the level of uh, uh, thought 
right? As well as like on a kind of social, political, economic level, basically. Uh, so in some ways, right, there's a kind of critical diagnosis of apprehension that I see uh, in, in Wordsworth. Uh, I see it in Kant and Hegel, um, really throughout the kind of romantic canon, basically. On the other hand, right, there is this kind of poetic form of apprehension. And this is something that I think the romantics are, are really sort of distinctively articulating, which, you know, as you said, you put this pretty nicely, right, uh, tries to imagine other ways of relating to the natural world, right? Um, for Wordsworth and Shelley, I think in particular, for Mary Wollstonecraft, I think in her own way too, um, there's a sense in which poetry right, might in fact, like, make it possible for us to kind of think about and therefore interact with nature differently. So they see uh, poetic thinking, let's put it that way, as a way of kind of departing from uh, uh, the sort of main lines of thought, right, and therefore the main lines of practice, basically, uh, in the period. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Keats was a romantic, right? Yes. There's a there's a famous there's a famous line by Keats. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I I quoted myself I, in my notes. I put the the excerpt from the poem, but I don't remember what. Uh, actually, I didn't write down where, which poem is from, but uh, mm -hmm. I can put it on the screen or whatever. But he he writes uh, famously. There was an awful rainbow once in heaven. We knew mm -hmm. her woo for texture she is given in the dull yeah. catalog of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line empty the haunted air the, mm -hmm. and gnomed mine unweave a rainbow as an erewhile made yeah um and so one one way to, to think about what, what he seems to be saying i think it was in maybe in uh yeah he, he references newton or something in that context i'm yeah, not sure absolutely but, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's from the poem lamia and uh he is think, he's thinking about newton yeah definitely right. um and so this uh the sense that philosophy can um clip an angel's wings mm -hmm. uh unweave a rainbow is there yeah. is there a tension between uh the philosophical work serious serious philosophical work done in poetry on the one hand and the the kind of naive uh aesthetic pleasure that a person might get by encountering uh a poem without any of the philosophical apparatus mm -hmm. uh i mean i think the answer is yes uh See, I, I thought you were going to go in a slightly different direction. I'm sorry. That, Tell me how I should question. have gone. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that, I'll regret that, it. I'm not going that uh, way. I was, I was just expecting um, something a little bit different, which is, you know, in some sense, right, that those lines from Keats are often read as a kind of, uh, you know, statement of like the conflict between, you know, a scientific understanding of the world and a sort of poetic understanding right. of that the world. Right, that would have been a good way to go also. Poetic I see what uh, you approach, mean. Yes. approach to the world. Um yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm trying like really studiously not to kind of resurrect the old science versus poetry sort of uh, conflict uh, in in a variety of of ways. I just don't think that kind of framing of the problem really uh, you know captures what the romantics are are up to. Um, they're really interested in the natural sciences, right? The kind of scientific understanding of the world is actually like really really important to them. I think actually, you know, part of what I'm trying to get at, right? Is that the distinction is less between science and poetry than it is between, uh, you know, understanding toward control, basically, or exploitation, and understanding of nature that's, uh, you know, looking towards something else, right? Looking towards a different way of sort of being in the world, uh, a way of being in the world that might imagine a kind of reconciliation, right, between humanity and, and nature, ultimately. Uh, and so I think, again, the distinction science poetry is a little less important maybe than we tend to assume that it might be. In terms of, uh, you know, thinking about the Keats lines as a way of like thinking about poetry, right? right. Like, do we that need all this? That twist yeah. that I made that was yeah. unexpected. I'm sorry. Well, no, I think that's really interesting, right? Like, is, is this a, a kind of, uh, you know, a uh, uh, kind of question, right, about like whether or not we need all this sort of like analytical critical apparatus, right? To understand what are you know objectively and intuitively and pretty immediately write some some beautiful lines of poetry uh yeah i mean that's uh you know a fair question i i think the answer is no you know you don't really need the the uh sort of philosophical machinery you don't need to do all this heavy lifting right just to find you know keats or wordsworth beautiful obviously i don't think they wrote with uh you know uh you know, the kinds of uh, 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 sorts of demands of like literary critics in mind necessarily that we uh, 
you know, are, are sort of, uh, you know, pursuing basically or living by. Uh, at the same time, right, I mean, I think these writers knew a lot. Uh, I think they knew more than we do, basically, uh, about a lot of things. Uh, and, and, I, and I do think um, just on the level of like, uh, you know, form and style, right, I think there's a lot of really, really serious work that goes into these poems um, that I think is a little bit hard to see sometimes without, uh, you know, a bit of an analytical approach. And so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the poetry doesn't need the criticism, right? But I think it stands up to it. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. That's well said. I love that. Also, I think, I think, um, I think critical apparatus can can open someone's eyes to what's going on in, in a way that uh, supports the the immediate aesthetic experience. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. And, you know, I should say, too, I mean, I'm personally just still moved by all of this stuff after, you know, years of uh, reading, teaching, thinking about it, uh, you know, just even reading, you know, Tintern Abbey, right, the most familiar of Wordsworth poems, it's still a kind of overwhelming experience for me at times. And so, you know, that kind of aesthetic pleasure, I think it's uh, just an absolutely essential part of what the, these poets are up to. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I, as as you pointed out nicely and and helpfully, I, I made a like a an unusual reading of that of that Keats line, and inherent in that unusual reading was this um analogy I'm making implicitly mm -hmm. between uh the way Keats talks about apprehension of the natural world, and the way in which a reader might apprehend uh, a beautiful poem. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that if that ties into some you know to something you've, you've, you've written about or thought about in terms of, yeah. uh, in thoughts, wilderness, perhaps, but the way, the way the experience of being in nature, uh, as a, as a parallel track to the experience of, uh, being in the presence of a, of a great, of a great work of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of continuities there. Uh, you know, it's not something I wrote about that much in the book. Uh, it's something I've thought about a bit. Uh, you know, it's hard to kind of, uh, give a simple answer to the question, but I, I think ultimately, right, certainly in the world of like uh, aesthetic theory, the world of romantic idealist philosophy, there's a huge amount of continuity, right, between the way that uh, the aesthetic experience of a poem and the aesthetic experience of something in nature, um, these things are, are, are considered uh, in quite similar terms, right? They're sort of theorized in quite similar ways. And really this begins, you know, as I said, a few, uh, moments ago, this begins with Kant, right, in the Critique of Judgment, where uh, beauty, right, is a category that really does kind of cut across art and nature. Things get more complicated, right, as the decades go on. But yeah, I think there's a lot of commonality there, in part, right, because, you know, for the philosophers in the period, you know, the object itself, right, the poem, or the flower, as the case may be, the bird, whatever the example you want to sort of cite uh, uh, might be, um, is in some ways a little less important, right, than the kind of uh, relationship to it that we we have, right, or the sort of state of consciousness that we adopt uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in the presence of that thing or that being. Uh, and so in some ways, right, the kind of uh, receptivity right, the sort of like uh, suspension of a desire to control or to sort of act on the thing, right, on the aesthetic object. Um, these are the things that become really, really important, right, uh, in the kind of romantic moment. Uh, and so in some ways, right, this explains partly why a poem and a flower uh, can be theorized in pretty similar terms. Mm. I'm mindful of our time. Um, as we, as we wind down here, um, maybe, maybe sort of to close, um, mm -hmm. can you, can you make a, a case for the importance of, of studying, you know, such things? I mean, you, obviously the whole conversation was that case. I mean, there's nothing, sure. <laughs> in a sense, there's nothing to add. Um, yeah. but, but specifically, you know, maybe in terms of like what you do as, as a teacher of students, uh, how you think about that role, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what, what you think, uh, students today, you know, yeah. uh, might might benefit from from that line of study, um, and and then maybe just you know in terms of like um, what does it mean to live the good life? You know, in yeah. in the year twenty twenty three, as the case may be, and how does how does our literature uh, intersect yeah. with that? Yeah, I mean, those are really important questions. You know, I think there's a a few different ways to 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 think about these sorts of issues. 
as we've been suggesting, right, I do think in romanticism, right, there's a real kind of intensity uh, uh, to the thinking about nature that they're doing, the kind of writing about nature, either in poetry or in philosophy, that's really kind of unparalleled. And so, you know, in our own moment, right, when people are really returning to these questions for obvious reasons, right, in the face of uh, climate change and so forth, uh, you know, there's a, a, a real kind of urgency, I think, to returning to these romantic texts. Um, you know, there's nowhere else, I don't think, uh, where, where nature is kind of investigated as sort of seriously and really kind of as passionately as, as in romantic writing. So this would be one answer to that, to that question, a really sort of specific answer. You know, more broadly, in terms of the kind of reading and teaching of literature today, you know, again, there's a variety of ways to approach that, that problem or that, that question. Uh, I'll give you a kind of romantic answer because that's uh, you know our topic for for today. Um, but you know, I'll appeal to Kant again in the critique of judgment. Kant outlines this idea of uh, what he calls a kind of purposiveness without a purpose, right? So a form of uh, organization or sort of formal harmony um, in consciousness, right, but also in the natural world, right, a, a kind of structure in some sense um, that can't really be reduced uh, to immediate utility, right? So this is a form of thinking about organization, right, without uh, necessarily reducing it to usefulness. Uh, this is, for the romantics, right, a really, really important way to kind of think about the experience of art, to, uh, to think about the experience of nature too, right, to think about aesthetic experience broadly. Uh, it's defined, right, by this kind of form of purposiveness without a purpose. In Schiller, I think really sort of famously, uh, the kind of social and political implications of this are really, really spelled out quite, quite interestingly. Uh, and, you know, I would just say that in general, right, the encounter with a work of art uh, is sort of a reminder. Uh, uh, again, if we think about it in these particular terms, uh, it's a reminder that there are different ways to kind of think about or to sort of be in the world. There are other forms of, uh, you know, feeling essentially um, that really can't be reduced uh, or sort of like made harmonious with the sort of demands uh, of, of capitalist modernity. And so uh, I think this is a useful reminder, uh, uh, especially today. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think I think the um, thinking about just that the sense of alienation from nature, which is a theme mm -hmm. of you know what we've been talking about today, and and you, capitalist modernity as um yeah as not uh, the only way of of living in the world, and and the way in which it imposes uh, strictures on our on our thinking and our being absolutely um, that are invisible, um, absolutely. and 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 there's something uh, missing perhaps, or something uh, limiting if we don't interrogate those assumptions, those hidden assumptions and those hidden perspectives. And uh, yeah, I, th I would, I would argue there's no better way to do that than walking in nature. And yeah. there's possibly no better way to do that than by, you know, appreciating um, art, which is interested in these questions and these tensions as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is one of the things that the romantics really do. Yeah. Put, put, uh, yeah. Put out there for us to, to consider. So this has been wonderful for me. Um, the, well, your, you. This conversation has inspired me to, uh, <laughs> you know, revisit some uh, some romantic poetry that I haven't uh, Great. looked at in a long, long time. Um, well, I hope so. And so I'm very grateful. Um, and and so so again, so th thank you, um, Dr. Elliman, for for your time. I appreciate it. Of course, it. yeah. Thanks so much for uh, uh, the conversation. It's been terrific. Thank you so much.